Today, we are going to talk about the characteristics of a Geiger Miller tube. A Geiger Miller tube, or GMT for short, is nothing more than an ionization chamber that operates at a high voltage. Let's first focus on the practical part where we determine the so called Geiger region, and then I will briefly address the functionality and the analysis. First, let's get the device up and running, power on, and there also, a measurement time of 2 minutes is required. So we press presets and then up there we have a display where we can see the measurement time. Below it there is an equation that tells us what value we are currently setting. mn times 10 to the power of p. We need 2 minutes, so 0 2 times 10 to the power of 2 since we see that this value is given in minutes multiplied by 0 0.01 and so the result is 2 minutes. I hate this calculation. Here's a rough exercise. How long would you measure with this setting and how long with this one? After you inserted the season 137 sample in the second slot, you can now quickly increase the voltage in steps of 100 volts until you see the first counts. That happened at 1280 volts, but the display showed 1240 volts. Now we only pay attention to what we set with the dials. Now the voltage is increased in 20 volt steps and a data point is generated for each step. When do you know where to stop? At some point you start to get a lot of counts and you might get a bit skeptical. Should it be like that? You can set a defined upper limit by removing the radioactive source because eventually a single ionization event from the normal background can cause a cascade in the counter if the voltage is too high and then we are just measuring garbage. So around 1600 volts would be pointless to measure in this case. If you forget this and keep going you might hear something like this. Ideally the assisting person should have said something 10 minutes before, but in this voltage range you definitely damage the several hundred euros expensive Geiger tube. You just hear the electricity frequency. Ok, now onto the theory. Let's take a closer look at the device. Ionization chamber, proportional counter and Geiger Müller tubes differ primarily in the operating voltage, though some are preferred in certain designs. If I take another close look at this counter, by the way these values you measure here are absolutely not comparable to any other device. You can clearly see the very thin counting wire usually made of tungsten or molybdenum. This is a counter tube with a mica window. This is thin enough to allow alpha particles to pass through. Such a counter uses gas ionization caused by incoming ionizing radiation. I believe most of us have seen this diagram online. A cylindrical cathode and then the anode isolated from it with high voltage applied. Where radiation passes through the gas it knocks out an electron and this electron is accelerated towards the anode by the electric field, whose strength depends on the applied voltage. The number of electrons and ions generated is proportional to the energy deposited as long as we are operating in the proportional range. So at lower voltages ionization causes a simple current flow. At higher voltages, even in the proportional range, the primary electrons from the ionization are accelerated so much that they can ionize additional gas molecules on the way to the anode. With further voltage increase it leads to a full discharge, which is called the Geiger range. This plateau is the working range of a Geiger Müller tube, which we aimed to determine in this experiment. At this point there is chaos in the Geiger tube. The accelerated electrons can also excite gas molecules which then return to the ground state while emitting photons. These photons can generate new ion pairs in the counting gas and so on and so on and chaos and due to this avalanche like discharge the counter tube is temporarily unusable for measurements. A cloud of ions remains around the anode which unlike the electrons moves very slowly. When I say slowly it still means 500 microseconds. Either the voltage is briefly switched off to stop the discharge or a quenching gas is used such as methanol at 10 millibars or a halogen like bromine at 0.1 millibars. This extinguishing gas must be easily excitable by photons to absorb the 
aforementioned photons through the electronic excitation. Once this is done, the recovery time follows during which the original potential on the wire is restored. If you were to keep increasing the voltage, the gas would decompose and the Geiger tube would be ruined. So here are my raw values, which I collected in the earlier part of the video. What do we see here? Let's take a look at the literature. Okay, it's the Wikipedia graphic. From 1300 to 1320 volt, you can see the proportional range. Then it rises again, and then we have our plateau or Geiger region. It's around 1350 to 1400 volts. Why not up there? A plateau is not 20 volts wide. And the recommended operating voltage is also written on the Geiger tube. It's around 1300 something. Here's a note for our students. These values can vary by quite a lot, easily by plus or minus 2000 counts. Even if you think you've placed the source in the exact same spot under the counter, geometry, distance, slight voltage fluctuations, all of this can affect the measurements. And one more thing, there are two counters. If you take measurements on the other one, you can't really compare the values to the ones shown here in this video. However, the general curve should be similar. Okay, now we've experimentally determined the measuring range, in technical terms the Geiger region of the counter tube, and in another experiment following next week, we can determine the aforementioned dead, dead time. In summary, ionizing chamber, proportional counter and Geiger-Miller tubes can all be operated with the same counter tube, just with different operating voltages. Yes, there are also flow counters, which are proportional counters, just with a bit of different design, but this wasn't really relevant for today's experiment. A special thanks goes to the working group of analytics and fundamental nuclear chemistry from Dr. Erik Strupp and the division of nuclear chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, thank you for your attention and goodbye.